Commissioner Beeman. Commissioner Hodge. Present. Commissioner Jefferson. Here. Commissioner Labar. Present. Commissioner Machieski. Commissioner Morgan. Commissioner Sanders. Present. Commissioner Scott. Here. Commissioner Shink. Here. We have a quorum. All right. Okay, we're gonna move into public participation. So here at working session, you get one minute to give public comment. And then if you are joining us via Zoom, you will hit star nine to raise your hand, and then you'll hit star six to unmute yourself when you've been called on. If you're here, we welcome you to the podium uh, where you have your 60 seconds. And there's a nice little light indicator there that lets you know as your time is running out. If you would hope, if you'd like to speak more than one minute, please join us for our second meeting where you would get three minutes. Anybody want to give public comment? We do have two hands raised on the Zoom call. Okay. Uh, first up is uh, Margaret Shankler. Okay, Margaret. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, I just want to say thank you for having this session to explain the public safety budget. Um, I've got a lot of questions, but one in particular has to do with the surpluses that the sheriff's department um, might accrue and what happens to them. Um, it looks like in 2014 that there was a special memo that um, allowed the sheriff's department to keep their surpluses or, or have them return to them. And so I'm just wondering if that's still in effect. Why did was the sheriff's department singled out for that? Um, and for the years that this was in practice, uh, how much surplus was retained over those years by the sheriff's department? Um, I sent you all um, uh, an email with links to these memos and so forth. So um, if you um, want to learn more about what I'm talking about, that should be either in your packet or your email. Thank you. Thank you. Have anybody else? Next up is M. Williams. M. Williams. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, I'm going to reserve most of my comments for the three minute session, but I did want to just provide just in this one minute um, for the three minute session, I'm going to be providing some clarity in regards to some uh, things that I saw at the last meeting. Um, the meeting before last. And I just want to make sure that that is clarified that I will be providing that clarity within the three minutes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Anybody else? That is the last one on Zoom. Last one on Zoom. Anybody in the room? Not seeing anybody? Okay, well, we are going to move on to report of the county administrator. No report. Okay, that's quick. Okay, we're gonna to move to a report of the Board of Commissioners Liaison. No report. Okay, moving on to our discussion items. So we have two today, and our first one is a report from the Washtenaw Health Plan. We're all very excited for this. I, I am, I'm sure. Good. All right, give me a minute to uh, get the technology set up. Hi there, I'm Jeremy Lapidus. I'm the executive director of the Washington Health Plan. Uh, I've been the executive director for the last two and a half years. Uh, excited to be here today to give you all an overview of the Washington Health Plan. Um, the Washington Health Plan is a, a, a independent 501c3 organization. Our mission is to help low-income individuals and uninsured individuals access high quality health care and health promoting services. Although we are our own independent nonprofit with our own board of directors, we are very closely aligned with the county and the Department of Public Health. We lease all of our employees from the Department of Public Health and the county has been a big supporter for the Washington Health Plan over the years. Uh, in fact, we consider ourselves to be the healthcare access arm of Washington County's Public Health Department. So the goal of the presentation today is just to 
provide you an overview of the Washington Health Plan, as well as give you some familiarity into the issues facing low-income individuals and uninsured individuals in Washington County when they try to access health care. I thought the best way to do this was to walk you through a client story of the Washington Health Plan of somebody we've helped. So I'll do, start by doing that. Then I'll talk a little bit about our impact model. I'll look at some data and talk about the broader community impact. And then I'll talk about the responses to the community, different community needs we've seen. And I'll end with the Washington Health Plan's finances. So uh, I wanna start with our client's story. Uh, ND is an 80 year old woman who is a, uh, went to the emergency department with low back pain. She had diabetes and hypertension as well when she went to the emergency department. When she, uh, just a little more information about her, she speaks very little English. Uh, she's very low income. She's an immigrant who has been in the country less than five years. And that's important because if you've been here less than five years, uh, you're not eligible for Medicaid. When she went to the emergency department, she had no insurance, and there she was signed up for Medicaid anyways. And this is a mistake that we see often at the health plan. Insurance is really confusing. There's lots of difficult, complex policies, and lots of people make mistakes in this process. And the Washington Health Plan's here to help people fix those mistakes. Um, so what actually ended up happening was ND was afraid to get follow-up care. She was afraid that using her health insurance would affect her immigration status. And this is something that we see at the Washington Health Plan commonly and in Washington County. It's actually an intentional effect of the anti-immigration rhetoric that we've seen over these last few years, as well as the constantly changing policies. We've been part of research that has showed the chilling effect that this has on the use of healthcare and public benefits. And the Washington Health Plan works to counteract this, this anti-immigration rhetoric and to make Washington County a welcoming place for immigrants and for everyone to access healthcare. So NT was afraid to get follow-up care. She wasn't getting her diabetes treated. She wasn't getting her hypertension treated and she wasn't getting her low back pain looked at. So she thought she was probably not eligible for Medicaid. So she didn't wanna use her insurance and she tried to call the hospital that originally helped her. She tried to call the Medicaid office, MDHHS and they were all unable to help her and help her figure out what was going on. Because we're located across the courtyard from DHS, and because we have a pretty good relationship with them, they said, why don't you walk over to the Washington Health Plan and see if they can help you? So she walked over to the Washington Health Plan, and through an interpreter, we were able to understand her fear of using her health insurance and how it might impact her immigration status. This is a part of what we do at the Washington Health Plan. We look at the whole person, and we look at every, every part of it. So we're making sure that they're getting the right health insurance, and also that they're actually gonna use that health insurance. So we worked with her and we determined she was not actually eligible for Medicaid. And we closed her Medicaid account and got her on marketplace insurance with subsidies. That's also colloquially known as Obamacare. Um, and we helped her make an appointment with a primary care office and she got her medications for her diabetes, got her medications for high blood pressure. We helped her understand that using her health insurance, this health insurance, which she actually qualified for, would not impact her immigration status. And we also referred her to the Michigan Immigrants Rights Coalition in case she had any issues with uh, any immigration issues when she went to apply to become a US citizen. So the impact is ND now has insurance. She now has a primary care doctor with access to medication. She's financially protected should anything happen in the future if she need health care. And also her insurance is paying providers in our community to take care of her. So there's a financial reimbursement for providers there. So now I wanna walk you through uh, our impact model a little bit more. So you've seen the client's story. Uh, on the left side here, you can see we help people apply for health insurance and public benefits. We are a place where anyone can walk in and we will find you affordable healthcare coverage. Because the Washington Health Plan exists, we are one of the only counties in the state where you can really say that no matter who you are, you can come and get healthcare coverage. And we are the experts in health insurance and healthcare coverage so that when other providers in the community don't know what to do, they turn to us. 
We also connect people, which connect people to primary care as well as mental health services. We have a collaboration and partnership with Washtenaw CMH through, our mental, through the public safety and mental health millage. We also connect people to dental services. We're the administrators of the Washtenaw County Dental Fund. And we help resolve other barriers to care. If somebody experiences, if somebody has an unpaid bill, they're not gonna go to get medical care for uh, something else that's bothering them. Or if they can't get to the doctor's office, or if they're not sure there's somebody who's gonna be there who speaks their language. So we help address not only health insurance, but also these other issues which prevent people from getting health care. And we're, very, we're accessible for walk-ins, for phone appointments. We're located uh, in the 555 Towner building right next to public health across the way from Washington CMH. Um, and we focus on the whole person getting the whole story so we can make sure we're connecting with them to build relationships so that they trust us. And so we make sure we can actually get them the right health insurance. From an impact standpoint, an individual level, we're, we're getting more people in the county to have insurance, healthier residents, better financial stability. And then from a community perspective, we're bringing money into the county because healthcare providers are being reimbursed for their services that are, they're providing. And we're also working to improve the systems that provide healthcare for our low-income individuals. We have a WASHNA advisor, or a WHP advisory board, which meets and brings together healthcare providers that serve low-income individuals to talk about policy changes or other things we can do to improve healthcare services locally. So now I wanna zoom out a little, and I wanna talk about the number of folks that we serve in a year. Uh, we serve about 5,500 individuals in a year. About 2,400 of them are Washington Health Plan members. That means that they do not qualify for any other health insurance. And these are, many of them are immigrants. And um, then about 3,500 individuals we help get on health insurance either through Medicaid or through Marketplace or Obamacare. Of the folks that are on the Washington Health Plan, uh, in a year they, they um, have 4,500 medical visits, over 12,000 prescriptions, and almost 700 mental health visits. And all of these preventative health care services they would not have received had it not been for the Washington Health Plan. They were not eligible for any other service, and they may have just shown up in the emergency room. In addition to all that work we do on helping people with health insurance, we also help them navigate other services. So we helped 500 people navigate health care, and this could be uh, helping them with appointments or helping them get transportation to a doctor's appointment. We helped over 200 people with billing or medical debt issues, and we helped over 700 people with issues they faced with the Department of Health and Human Services, which could be as simple sounding as changing your address, which is actually really, really hard to do. And it shouldn't be. Uh, we also helped over 450 people get on uh, food assistance. And I also wanna look at the financial impact that the Washington Health Plan has in the county. Uh, health insurance has been shown to improve the health of, of residents. It protects them from medical debt. And it's even been shown to lift people out of poverty. And this is why I'm so passionate about what we do, because giving somebody health insurance is not just helping them once. It's helping them for the rest of their life while they have health insurance. It's helping them not worry about whether they're going to have to pay for medical care. They can get healthy. They can find a job and do other things. It helps people get out of poverty. And so we also tried to look at what is the financial impact the Washington Health Plan has in the county. This is really hard to estimate, but we looked at based on the number of people that we get health insurance, this brings in about $10.5 million to uh, providers in the county each year. And that's a lot of money. Uh, we also, this also doesn't include uh, the people that we help get on Medicaid, which contributes to the funding that goes directly to Washington County CMH. All right, so now I wanna talk a little bit about the WHP's responsiveness to changing community needs. Uh, because we are a place that anybody can walk into and get healthcare, um, we often see things before larger health systems or larger providers see them, so we're able to respond quicker. Uh, when the Affordable Care Act was rolled out, we helped transition many people to Medicaid. During COVID-19, we partnered with the Public Health Department to set up pop-up testing and vaccine clinics 
mainly with the Latino community. And I believe you're going to be honoring Maria Melitzer a little bit later today, and we worked closely with her. Uh, recently, we've been helping to connect Afghan and Ukrainian refugees with health care. And right now we're busy preparing for the end of the public health emergency. Uh, the public health emergency uh, was declared in March of 2020. It was a federal dec declaration. And at that time, uh, they said that uh, people cannot lose Medicaid. And that's been continuing since March of 2020. We're not sure when it's gonna end, but we think it's gonna end pretty soon, maybe as soon as July. And what that means is that a lot of people are gonna to have to either renew and prove they're eligible for Medicaid again or transition to another ins insurance. We've currently got a request in and looking forward to the conversation with Administrator Dill tomorrow about some ARPA funds to help us with this uh, effort. Um, there were 53,000 people on Medicaid in March of 2020. In January of 2022, there's 67,000 now. So that's, you know, not quite a fifth of the county, but getting close to it. They're on Medicaid, and they're all going to have to either say that I'm still eligible for Medicaid, or they're going to have to transition to another insurance. And I just want to show you a map of what it looks like for um, who's on Medicaid in Washington County. So you can see the larger map there, and then you can see the blobs of Ann Arbor and Ypsilanti. The darker shades of red are where the higher proportion of uh, residents who are on Medicaid live. And you can see that on the east side of the county in the Ypsilanti and Ypsilanti Township area, that's predominantly where the larger proportions of folks with Medicaid live. And this is not that surprising. Uh, this is, uh, this are the same folks that were hardest hit by COVID, disproportionately people of color. And in July of 2020, when this Board of Commissioners declared racism a public health crisis, this is what racism as a public health looks like. This is what systemic racism looks like. There are <laughs> um, black, black and Latino residents of our county are going to be kicked off of Medicaid. Thousands of people are gonna lose insurance. And it's because of this uh, bureaucratic system that we have that tries to keep people off of insurance. And this is what systemic racism looks like. It's not fancy, it's not in your face, but it is, we're gonna have thousands of people disenrolled from Medicaid unless we're able to do something about it. And the Washington Health Plan is trying to do something about it. We're trying to get the word out to residents. We want to help as many people as possible either maintain their insurance or transition to new insurance that they're eligible for. And frankly, we're gonna need help of everybody in the county, all the providers and as much staff as we can get for it. Now I wanna talk a little bit about the WHB's finances. Uh, we have $2.3 million in revenue each year. Uh, about 25% of that comes from uh, Washington County, the County Indigent Care Funding. About 25% of that uh, is uh, contributions from health systems. About 30% comes from grants. Uh, and you, just to note, when I took over as executive director, we had one grant and now we have five grants. So trying to grow that. Uh, and 20% comes from Medicaid match funding, which is federal funding we're able to leverage through our close partnership with the public health department. We have $2.7 million in expenses. About half of that goes towards program staff who are helping people navigate healthcare issues and get on health insurance. About 33% goes towards paying for medical expenses for our members and about 17% towards operating and county administration. And so you'll notice there's a deficit we have uh, about $400,000 deficit there. This deficit began when the Affordable Care Act was rolled out when the Washington Health Plan's main source of funding, which was disproportionate share hospital funding was removed because the state said, well, everybody's gonna have Medicaid now. So we're not really, we're not gonna continue this funding. Uh, and at the time, the Washington Health Plan was preparing for this and so built up a healthy fund balance or fund reserve. And in our conversations with our four partners, the county, public health, and the health systems, we said, 
we're, we decided we would spend down the fund reserve until it was time to ask for more support. And so this is a, what our fund reserve looks like. Uh, in 2016, it hit the high of 7.2 million. And you can see that we're, we've been, de we've been uh, lowering and spending our fund reserve. Uh, and we've been trying to do this uh, diligently and smartly. It's actually, we thought it would last until around 2019, but because of uh, increased contributions from the health systems and our ability to leverage Medicaid match through the public health department, we've been able to make it last a little longer. But it's not gonna last that much longer. And over the next couple of years, we wanna have conversations with our core partners, with the county, with the two major health systems to figure out how to uh, address the structural deficit. So I just wanna say thanks to our core partners here, Washington County government, of course, Washington Public Health probably should have been on here, uh, Michigan Medicine and uh, Trinity Health. And uh, there's my contact info, looking forward to our conversation. All right, well, thank you. Excellent presentation. So I'm sure there are some questions. Commissioner Shink. Thank you. I appreciate I appreciate you coming and, and talking to us about all the things you do and how it intersects with poverty and intersects with the um, effort to to reduce poverty for people in our county. Um, can you, if you haven't already, can you share the slide deck with us, please? Yes, I believe they were shared. Okay. Sorry, I just maybe didn't notice. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'd be happy to resend also. All right. Any other thoughts? Mr. Morgan. Uh, thanks, Jeremy. No questions. Uh, I'm familiar with the program. It's great to hear that storyline approach of how somebody uh, connects with the program and how it's helpful. I think this is an incredible program that we have in this community, and we should certainly continue to do whatever we can to be supportive and helpful. Uh, and I am very uh, glad to hear that you are looking very, very closely at how do we make sure that folks are still taken care of uh, as we kind of move beyond the pandemic. I think there are a lot of amazing things that were expanded and offered to individuals throughout the pandemic that frankly I wish would continue going forward. I think it's clear that that social safety net provided by state and federal support should continue, but as we know that it will not happen. Um, so whatever we need to do locally, um, I hope that you will uh, stay in touch with us as, as the county uh, to help make sure that we know where we can be more helpful or where we need to be helpful if we're not. So thank you very much for all the work that you're doing. Thank you, Commissioner Morgan. I think I saw Commissioner Labar's hand. Maybe you're just waving at me, I don't know. Thank you, Chair. Um, I agree the presentation was great, but uh, the work of the health plan uh, is sadly necessary, but fantastic in execution. I, I guess you've, you've covered all these issues. Um, I, I worry continually about the status of folks who don't speak English as their first language or, or, or do not speak proficient English. And I worry particularly about what you mentioned in terms of uh, issues of immigration status and so forth. Um, I hope you will keep us in the loop in terms of the resources needed there with those issues in particular. Um, that's something that uh, is, is certainly the case in my district on the, on the east side of Ann Arbor. Any other big issues that are floating out there that you think, I don't wanna walk away from the meeting with the board having not just raised this point or said this thing. And if there's not, that's fine, but uh, I want to make good use of your time. Well, thank you. Uh, you know, I think with regards to the health plan, uh, I think the public health emergency is the big thing we're preparing for uh, currently. So we have a short-term staffing need, but then as you saw with our deficit, we also have a long-term budgetary need. Uh, but, and I'm excited for, to talk to Commissioner, or to um, Administrator Dill tomorrow about our ARPA request, which uh, is joint with OCED um, because they're in need of assistance or funds for utility assistance and rental assistance, which funds which are a part of the expanded social safety net during COVID that are running out. All right, other thoughts or questions? Well, people are thinking, I'll, I'll throw one at you. Uh, so, you know, I'm a big fan of the mobile 
health RV, the health mobile. Uh, have there been any conversations about the health plan riding along that and going and, and using that or the MSSI once those are out uh, to get people signed up? Yep, we have had conversations about that. Um, you know, because of the pandemic, we haven't been able to enact that, but would certainly be very interested in doing that and uh, seeing that happen. Okay, so there's some sort of targeted strategy being developed. Yeah, some sort of targeted strategy. If, you know, we would look at the map and, you know, think about where we could best be utilized. Okay, um, all right. Yep, and I think when we know more about the public health emergency, we're going to be able to know how best to use that and what message to send out when we do that. Thank you. Do we have any other questions, thoughts? Doesn't look like it. Okay, well, Jeremy, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. Uh, looking forward to hearing more from you. All right, so we are having some technical issues with our live streams on Facebook, uh, the Washington County website, and on YouTube, so the trifecta there. Um, so we understand you, you can hear us, but you can't see the video or the presentation. So we're working towards a solution, but in the meantime, if you join via the Zoom link, you'll be able to see the video as well as hear the audio. Um, so the information on how to join the Zoom link or the Zoom call uh, is on washington.org slash webcast, or you can look on our agenda. Okay. We are going to move into our second presentation for today. It's the 2022 budget discussion. You know, we've been doing this every working session. This time we're taking a look at public safety and justice. Okay. Let me get the presentation up. There you go. Okay. Just want to thank you all for your time tonight as we go through um, a financial overview of the public safety and justice departments. Um, we are looking at 2021 actuals um, just to, for the combination of fiscal years and how budgets change throughout the year. So um, looking at all of public safety and justice, um, total revenues brought in were around $60 million. Um, over half of that was from the sheriff's office. Um, and then looking at the types of revenue that are brought in, uh, 35% is departmental revenue, which is represented by the fees, services, fines, forfeitures, um, and then other revenues within that. Uh, federal, state, and local revenues, which would include the public safety and justice grants and local reimbursements are 26%. And then taxes, which would be the sheriff's portion of the public safety and mental health millage, and then the EECS millage are 19%. And the last is 20% is transfers in, which is generally uh, general fund appropriations to non-general fund programs. Switching to the expenditures, um, the, there were $111 million in expenditures. Um, again, the sheriff's office is the majority at 62.6 uh, .6 million. The trial court represents about 19.1 million. And then from there, the programs significantly decrease. Uh, looking at the large cost centers uh, as a whole, as we expect, 65% is spent on staff. 15% um, is on other programming and services. 14% is the cost allocation plan. And then there's a small portion of fleet and transfers out to other funds. Okay. Looking at the Sheriff's Department, um, I know there's a lot on here. So thank you, Andrew. Um, and what we're doing is looking at how funds are used, what revenue is coming in by each program and what the expenditures are broken out as. Um, police services is the largest program within the sheriff's office. Um, they're funded, that yellow bar you see in the revenue is the police services revenue. Um, and then the remaining is funded by general fund. Um, other general fund revenues like general operating millage um, and then, some other small fines and fees. Um, on the bottom right, you see the contract policing, um, which cost 16.6 million in 2021. 
and 13.1 million of it was covered by sheriff revenue, which left a gap of 3.4 million. Um, that was basically covered by the, the public safety and mental health fund. Corrections is the next largest cost center. It's funded in, almost entirely by general fund, just the general fund revenues. Um, and then the sheriff millage generated $8 million, which was recorded in the general fund. Um, and then direct expenses in that org were 1.8 million and then the rest covered other sheriff services. Um, and then lastly, smaller programs from there with emergency services, administration, community corrections, et cetera. The trial court, um, again, the, the total program is around 19.3 million. Um, the friend of the court, which is our child support division, is the largest single program of the trial court. And it's funded by grant revenues and general fund appropriation. Um, the other large non-general fund program is the child care fund, which is funded in a similar manner. Of the general fund programs, the trial court administration is the largest and the remaining court programs are funded by court fees, a few small grants, and the rest is the general fund revenues of the generic other general fund revenues. Moving on to prosecuting attorney. Um, prosecuting attorney was about $7.2 million in 2021. The majority of these costs are staff providing criminal prosecution, conviction and integrity and expungements, victim witness services and the general fund. And then the largest grants are again, the child support division and then our participation in SACI, which is the sexual assault kit initiative. Um, there is a small amount of grant funding and they're working on other grants that we'll be seeing in the future. For district court, the total cost was 6.8 million. Um, district court is almost entirely general fund. Department revenues covered approximately 23% of their expenditures and um, a portion or small amounts for the judges is also covered by state revenue. Um, and then other general fund revenues cover the remaining um, or remaining portion of expenditures. Um, again, the expenditures are largely staff costs and then the cost allocation plan, which is just the indirect services that support running a department in the county. For public defender, there are two primary programs. Total was 5.1 million. The two programs are indigent defense, which is covered by the MIDC grant, and then also juvenile defense, which is funded by general fund appropriation. Um, again, the majority of staff, staff, staff costs, juvenile defense is about 12% um, of the total expenditures. And looking at children's services, um, this was 4.9 million grant revenues made up 2.7 million of which, and then the general fund appropriation made up 2.1 million. Um, to provide juvenile detention and education services. The new day treatment program that was added in fiscal year 22 is not reflected here, um, but it is something else that's been invested in. Um, and expenditures are 59% staff costs, programming and services are 21% and CAP makes up 20% of the budget. Then lastly, uh, there are five smaller agencies, um, the Enhanced Emergency Communication Services Millage, which covers the Enhanced 911 communications and is funded by that millage. Um, HIDA is the federal drug trafficking program and the county largely acts as a fiduciary for that, um, but it does show up on our books. And then DHS is the Child Care Fund Placements, Probation and Law Library, round out all of the public safety and justice departments. <laughs> So, um, and then I know we'll get to questions in a second, but coming up next, uh, at the next meeting will be the Health and Human Services, and we'll be moving on. Um, due to the cancellation now, everything has been shifted back one working session, so we'll be to board priorities in August instead of July. With that, I'm happy to answer any questions. I expect those questions. <laughs> Maybe I expected wrong. Commissioner Sheen. 
So I, I don't really know all the details, but I have seen some articles, I guess, that anticipate that the fees, fines, and forfeitures, forfeiture, sorry, might not be a long-term funding option for, for the courts or for the sheriff's office because um, of their equitable or their non-equitable impacts. Are you thinking about how that might affect budgets going forward? Or is there technical support that, that we can access around that? I mean, I think those discussions are always ongoing as we learn about the viability of that and any changes in fee structures, et cetera, would always um, impact the budget. The courts have been having fee and revenue issues for a while now, and then they were furtherly exacerbated by COVID. So um, I think that is something we are hoping by looking thoroughly at revenues, we can in the next, like in the budget process, we can get some more solid recommendations on keeping a balanced budget and having it be reasonable. Thank you. Other thoughts or questions? Commissioner Scott. I have ahead. a lot of questions. <laughs> Sorry. It's fine. I'll do my best. I know you will. And okay. I appreciate it. Um, slide on slide one, when it talks about revenues by department, and I'm looking at rev like it says revenue, where does the money come from? And I've got the sheriff. I might have been in a slide down, but that 30.61 million, where does that revenue come from? Yes. <laughs> that 30.61, if you go to the sheriff's slide, yeah. Um the bars that are um, sheriffs, I mean, the biggest percentage is sheriff services. That's probably half of that 30 million. Yeah. Um, and then it would be the federal, state, and local department of revenues. I can, um, if it'd be helpful after the meeting, send a follow-up of how that 30.6 breaks down in all of those categories, because it does kind of depend on the individual program. Um, but it is, I mean, there are some fines and forfeitures, but it's mostly uh, local reimbursements and then a few grants. Okay. Uh, next question, if I go to slide five, uh, and I'm looking at, and, and you, I don't expect you have this answer. So this okay. might be something you have to get back to me too on. Okay. Uh, how much is spent on criminal prosecution versus mm -hmm conviction integrity? Yeah, so um, one of the ways we've set up things currently in the general fund is all the prosecutor services are lumped together. So we can look at staff costs and look at who is assigned to which and give that as an estimate. Um, and I'd have to talk with the prosecutor's office and making sure we have those right assignments. Yeah. Um, but currently, they're not recorded in different orgs where we can easily pull them out of the financial system. So, okay. but we can definitely give you the staff assignments as a percentage. Okay. Um, and that might be it for my questions right now, but but finding the answers to some of those things that, that I just mentioned will be helpful. Okay. Thank yeah. you so much for the presentation. Too. You're welcome. Thanks. There's a lot to fit into a small amount of time, so. <laughs> And I appreciate it. Thank you. If you think you have other questions, we're running a little ahead of schedule. So let's let Commissioner Morgan go and feel free to jump back in. Thank you, Chair. Um, those were good questions. Those were also questions that I, I was uh, thinking about as well, just trying to figure out that, that 30 million. Um, as I read through this, are we listing um, cap? I know what cap is, of course. It's our cost allocation plan. But uh, how do we list that as uh, an expenditure or or revenue, it seems. Yeah, I just so, understand it on the slides because it. Yeah, from the department perspective, cap is always an expenditure. So okay. in this presentation, it's talked about as an expenditure solely, um, just to keep things clean. I think when we get to general government, it'll get a little messier as we talk about how the revenue flows <laughs> in. Okay, so we list it as an expenditure. Yes. Uh, and that's. Another way of looking at that would just be sort of the cost of the, the infrastructure, the yeah. you know. things, IT, electricity, okay. the desk. Um, I was thinking that was the case, but just wanted to make sure that I was understanding that correctly. Yep. Um, 
And then the other question I had was um, looking at the contract policing, and I just want to make sure I'm reading this correctly. So it's showing that we spend about sixteen and a half million dollars a year in contract policing, mm -hmm. but thirteen million of it is paid for fees from the jurisdictions, yes. and then about three, just under three and a half, is kind of that gap that we cover with millage funds or otherwise. Yes. Okay. Yep. And that was based on the actuals. Um, inside contract policing is also overtime reimbursements for special events. It's not solely PSU contracts because those are also things we contract out. So um, it's not broken out in that way, but in general, the overtime reimbursements don't have the gap that PSUs have, so. Okay, because one I know one of the criticisms I've heard um, it publicly about the, our budget is, is the amount of funds that go toward public safety uh, in particular. And I, I think it's because it's really hard to explain that contract services, how much is there. It's also hard to compare to other counties in terms of what they spend because we have this unique, pretty large amount of contract services, which I think is a positive thing for the community. I think it mm -hmm. saves local governments revenue. It saves us. Uh, it, it's a positive I think. Uh, and I think we get some pretty accountable policing services through the work countywide rather than each individual jurisdiction. But it is always really hard for me to explain. We don't really spend that much just in county policing. Yes. Um, so this is helpful. Uh, I do think it's helpful breaking that out and I appreciate you doing that. And I think my the rest of my questions, I think will be answered in terms of just understanding that 30 million that comes in as revenue. Mm -hmm. uh, and then thinking about what we actually spend from county general fund. Yeah, okay. So, I can add that to the analysis of the other county general fund dollars that are filling in those gaps. I think that's all I have for now. Thank you so much. Thanks, all sure. right, Commissioner Labar. Thanks, sure. Um, thank you for the presentation. Actually, Commissioner Morgan, your comments made me uh, think of something to, to, to highlight. I think the last time that the community, the sheriff's office, and the board of commissioners, and I'm, I'm putting the emphasis on, on this group, that we went through a public metric process around contract costs was either 2011 or 2012. And the reason I bring that up is because, Commissioner Morgan, you just referenced essentially that $3 million gap. Yeah. And to some degree, Back in 2017, when we were uh, going forward with the public health, or excuse me, the, the mental health and public safety millage, maintaining the service provided to contracting jurisdictions at essentially the same rate um, was, was part of the selling point on that millage. Uh, and that, that $3 million gap there is to some degree um, what, what's able to cover it, because if we hadn't done that, we would have had to decrease services or increase costs to maintain the, the, the same service level. Um, I think five years on now, four and a half years on, it's easy to, to, to forget some of that context. Um, I also think it'd be helpful to keep in mind as we look at the sheriff's office in particular, um, and maybe this is doable, the, sh the sheriff prior to Sheriff Clayton, um, that sheriff's office uh, and, the, and the board did not always see eye to eye on spending issues uh, to, to the point where there was litigation. Um, I think in, the, in, in Cl Sheriff Clayton's first term, he brought back something like $6 million into our general fund and that, that's only relevant because if you look at the numbers like over a 15 year period, it's going to fluctuate a lot. Um, the, the, the final point, and I think this is for, for the nine of us really is, um, I have tried to grapple with how do we respond as a policy body to what has, I think, rightly happened in our society in terms of questioning about what is the proper role of policing uh, a, a, a across the board. And I, I think I said this before, but one of the nuances that gets missed in Michigan are the constitutionally mandated services. Um, spelling out 
what those are and to which degree we are meeting them, I think would be very useful for us going forward because it's not as simple. Um, and the other thing is when we, when we talk about the sheriff's budget in particular, I hope we'll keep in mind for the for Washtenaw County context, many of the diversionary services, the, the services like reentry programs and others, many of those things that are most innovative are discretionary services that we choose to do. We choose to do them because morally they're the right thing and, 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 and the sheriff's office has, has worked with other groups on, on, on lots of those things to, to do them the right way. But we also have that ability in part because of this overall budget structure that, that gets us there in the first place, i.e. the structural revenue and the contracting relationships. Uh, that isn't a question, that's a diatribe. <laughs> um, I, I just say this because there are a lot of moving parts in this, in this, in this budget. Um, and this is great data, this is a great presentation. I do think we benefit though from stretching it back even, even 20 years. The data is there, uh, not all the context, but um, I, I, I would benefit from that chair. So uh, thank you and, and thank you for letting me expand here. It was a good diatribe. Uh, before I go back to Commissioner Morgan, anybody that hasn't asked a question yet, we're we gonna repeat. Nope, okay, Commissioner Morgan, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. I, I think Commissioner Barr laid out one of the questions that's been on my mind as we go through this budget in particular, but all of the different pieces of the budget is figuring out how do we assess the appropriate amount of money or the appropriate proportion of our county budget we should be spending in each different area. And I don't know how we answer that question. It's sort of a, here's what's always been done and we don't really uh, very, you know, stray far, too far from that. Uh, where it's at uh, each year. And I think that's a question as we think about more community engagement and feedback from the public, they're thinking, you know, they're looking at our budget and saying, you spend too much or too little in this area or that area. And honestly, I don't know how to know if that's the case or not, because we don't really have a good comparison to other communities. Uh, and we don't really have a good breakdown um, because I don't know how to create that breakdown of like, breaking up cost per type of service. So like, here's, here's what's mandated, here's what we have to do, bare minimum, if we want to do only the minimum amount of service uh, around public safety, for example. Here are the other really phenomenal things that we do in this community because we believe in social justice, we believe in restorative justice, and we want to invest in things that are community focused. How do you kind of explain that or tell that story or, or outline that? Um, as it relates particularly to the, the public safety department um, or you know, public safety sheriff's office uh, as a whole. I don't really know how to do that, but I wanna throw that out there in case you think of something. Um, this is your, your expertise, but you know, this question of how do we kind of explain, here's what we spend because we have to, here's what we spend in these different particular service areas because we want to and because they're good positive things. Yeah. Um... I definitely hear you. Oh, I don't have an answer on how, what the right proportions are. But I do know that one of the things we're working on in this year of budget preparation is working with each department. A few years back, we would do, um, we were called the mandated and discretionary services inventories where departments listed, these are the services we provided. Are they mandated? If they are, what kind of mandate is it? And how much do they cost? Um, and we were talking about, I'm not sure the individual, this for some department services got very detailed and made it a little bit hard to really follow. Um, but looking at the programs that are offered and are they mandated and using policing is a really great example of what is the minimum that's required? What is contract policing? And what is it that we do because we think it benefits public safety because that's the level we feel comfortable at. Um, and just knowing that, I guess having more intentional information on the decisions that are made instead of it just being, well, this is how we budgeted it. We keep budgeting the same amounts without really looking at that. So um, that is something we're hoping to finish this year and bring to the board as um, for your information to review and talk about as we build into the next year's budget development. Thank you. No, that's helpful. And I'm glad that you're thinking in that, that same way. 
is there any way we can kind of benchmark or compare what we do to other similar communities? Is that possible to say, okay, here's generally what we do, here's generally what some other similarly sized counties or similarly, counties are similar in different, different demographic or size categories? Yes, possibly. <laughs> um, we'd have to look at what that would look like. It's not something we've done in the past, but if we can uh, figure out a way to do it and um, without being able to, or without impacting the ability to do all of the other things, um, I think if that would be beneficial, we could definitely look into it and get back to you on how we might be able to do it. I do think it's probably going to involve calling communities, identifying which communities. So I think it's a bigger undertaking than just doing it. Um, but uh, I think valuable work is worth doing, so. So maybe it's not quite, we don't quite have the staff capacity for that at this point, but uh, I, I understand the, um, the balance of those things. I'm just trying to think through, it just sort of seems like whatever we, we just say we want to spend more or less uh, and it's kind of a one-off here and there as opposed to are we doing I just don't have a good comparison. And so yeah. that's what I think about. And yeah, I mean, definitely something to look into at least and see if there's easy, I don't know if there's easy access to the data, but if there's a couple of communities we really think are comparable and would want to benchmark, we can definitely try and do some research on that. So, okay. We can thanks. have more conversations about it though. Yeah, these are, please hear those more as um, ideas, uh, certainly more so than these are absolute things we have to do, but just trying to be able to communicate that message to the community of here's what we do and why, and and here's how we compare to others, uh, either positively or negatively, um, so that they have that kind of information. It's always something I've wondered, and I feel like looking at these presentations is, is probably the most I've really seen us dive into the nuts and bolts of each different funding area. And so I really, really appreciate it. This is very helpful to me and, and hopefully to all of us. Uh, so thank you very much. Thanks, Chair. <clears throat> Other thoughts or questions? Okay, while well, people are thinking of one, I'll throw one to you. So along the lines, we've been having the conversation around pulling out some of the data and really making it clear where some of the money is going uh, around the, the contract policing. Is there a way for you to pull it out so we see how much we're subsidizing by contract? <laughs> That's so, a tough one. Uh, there are estimates we have um, because there are at, like some part, a portion of the public safety contract is like a, you know, a sergeant supervising. And so we estimate how that goes. I don't know when the most recent detailed um, breakdown of what a PSU costs is and how much we charge. That is something that sheriff's office does typically work on um, and I would anticipate uh, is part will be part of the discussion of the new PSU rate, but we can definitely request that and get see what we can get um, around what that is. But it's mostly an estimate. That's okay. Okay, you know, I appreciate it if you could try to okay. give us an estimate. Sure. All right, thank you. Anything else from anybody? Okay, not seeing, oh, oh sorry, Commissioner Sheep. I just wanted to say thank you. I appreciate the graphs. I appreciate the conversation around it. It helps when, when I look at the budget, I can understand it, but it's not the same as when we really are seeing it with graphs where they're set off against each other and shows like what portion comes from where, what portion comes from where. So that's really helpful to me. And then just talking about it a little more in kind of a story format, it really is also helpful for me to understand the budget better. So Excellent. thank you. I appreciate the effort you put into this. Okay, thank you. All right, last call, everybody. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Have our technical difficulties been resolved? Are they able to see us? No, maybe. Oh. Oh, okay. I'm going to read this note at the end of the meeting. There you go. Oh, I'm just going to take this computer. Thank you. All right. Well, we're going to move on to the liaison reports. Anybody have a liaison report they'd like to like to give? No, not seeing any. Okay, I will give one now. So, Youth Commission, uh, they are continuing to work diligently on one their presentation to us that's coming up soon, and also all of their action projects. So, look forward to that. 
uh, we had a meeting recently, I think it was last Sunday. Uh, it was another really engaging meeting. And another piece about that, they are hosting a racial equity town hall on Sunday, May 15th from two to four at the neutral zone. You all probably already received an email about that, but if not, we'll make sure we get that to you too. It would really be nice for everybody to meet or and meet again, the youth commissioners that are in your district. Okay, that's, uh, that's it for me for now. Items for current future discussion? Oh, oh sorry. Oh, sorry, thank you. Um, I want to tell everybody that the SPARC annual meeting is on May 17th, and we will be unveiling the strategic plan, and it's really exciting. To, to have worked on it. And then also, of course, I can't divulge any details, but exciting to see the um, growth that Spark is making in its strategic planning. Excellent. Commissioner Beeman. Just saying I'm present. Oh, <laughs> Commissioner Beeman is present. I think Robert, Robert caught you when you walked in. Okay. Anybody else for uh, liaison reports or wanting to mention that you are present? No, okay. Uh, items for current and future discussion, does anybody have any? No, okay, pending items, we have none. All right, well, we're gonna adjourn. So before I ask for motion to adjourn, I'm gonna say to solve our streaming issues, we're gonna have to try to restart the whole system. Uh, so please rejoin the Zoom call at 7 p.m. for the Board of Commissioners meeting, and thank you for your patience. So now I'll look for a motion to adjourn. All right, all in favor. All right, all right we are adjourned. <laughs>